Uh, good morning, it's Peter here and I'm behind the bench with Bill this morning. How are you, Bill? Good, Peter. We're in the Brisbane showroom and we're going to actually take you a, through a tour of a bench. Uh, Bill, just explain what you're getting up to this morning. So we're just going to introduce a, a basic bench setup for any um, artisan, beginner jeweller, hobbyist, um, anyone creating jewellery in any aspect at all. This is how you'd set up your basic tools on a normal bench. So this is like an introduction to the bench and what you do from here is basically customise your bench to your style, your, your needs for your jewellery. But this is a very good starting point to get everything you need to make jewellery. Well, I'm sure there'll be a lot of people very interested in what you've got to say. So we'll man our positions, Bill, and uh, get into it. Okay, Bill, um, I can see you've got your bench all nicely laid out and I assume there's a bit of method in your madness here. Could you please take us through that? Oh, yes, yeah, Peter. Yeah, so yeah. the way I've laid the tools out here, it makes them easily accessible and um, accessible to your dominant hand. So in my case, I'm right-handed. So most of the tools I would use in my right hand are quickly accessible on this side. I also have less likely used tools or less used tools on the off side. And I also have the forming on the left side too. It just makes it easier for when you're using the hammers and forming to have it on this position. Um, it just feels a little awkward on the other side. You're very far away from your work. So this is a basic layout. So always customize it. So this is a starter setup. So I don't think this is how you have to have it, but if you start here, and then modify it to how you work and customise it to your style, um, you're in the right direction for having a very good setup on your bench. OK, beauty Bill. Well, let's start at the beginning then, shall we? OK, so we're going to work around left to right, basically. Um, first off, a steel block. So steel block comes in handy for forming, um, for um, chasing, hardening wire even. Um, and you can also flatten out things like um, earrings, you can make a range of earrings of these things as well. So steel block, quick one on maintenance for these. Any of your steel materials, the easiest way to maintain them is like a synthetic thin sewing machine oil for example. Um, the more times you put the oil down and wipe it off, the less likely you'll have to do it. It seems to absorb in quite nicely. The next piece we have through here is a mini anvil. And this is going to give you some curves that you wouldn't normally get with the steel block. The plus for this particular anvil is on the opposite side, we have a swaging area. So you can swage and get a gentle curve in there to give you some th more 3D um, shapes on your pieces. Next in line, we have a pair of parallel pliers. The parallel pliers only compress evenly. They don't pinch in the normal point most pliers do, so you won't get pitch mark, pinch marks on your metal. I'd use these for making ring shanks. Um, it just compresses the top of your ring ends in quite nicely without pinching. Um, very handy. Make sure you don't get one with teeth though. So there are these available with teeth. Not a good look on jewellery. Next we have the marking out. So in the marking out section here, we'll have a scriber. So this is a double-ended scriber that we have through AJS. Very sharp tips, nice and hard, gives you very clean lines. Next we have an automatic center punch. So the plus for the center punch that's automatic is you don't need a hammer. It'll just compress in under a spring tension and then click and give you the detent you need to help center your drill bits. Then we have a divider. So the divider can be used for marking out arcs and curves and circles. It can also be used for scribing out the width of metal you need. Um, you can just set it up to the measurement you need here and then scribe it down your metal to mark out. It leaves a very shallow mark so it's easily cleaned up at the end. It's more accurate to do it with the um, scriber and the divider because it gives you a very clean line. If you use textures and stuff like that, they have a thickness and it's really hard to define where on that thickness you're going to cut and move and file. Also have a set square. So the set square can give you 90 degree curves so you can get a bit of symmetry into your pieces. Um, really good for ring shanks too. You can square up the end of your, your ring shank strip before you start bringing it together and you'll get a closer joint. And we also have a steel ruler here. Um, you don't have to have a big one like I do. You can just have a 15 centimetre one. That's sufficient length to do all your jewellery pieces. Next. And next we move on to hammers, Bill. Certainly. So these are the three essential hammers you'd probably want to have on your bench. The first one is a rawhide hammer. 
So the rawhide hammer's claim to fame is it will move the metal, but it won't stretch the metal. Having said that, if you hit hard enough, you can mark the metal, so still be careful with them. So that's great for doing things like ring shanks. It'll square up the ring shanks on your mandrel. Um, re, um, move the metal around a bit without marking it and stretching it. Next hammer we have is a chasing hammer. So the plus for the chasing hammer has a very big head here and you can use this on stippling tools, chasing, um, dapping, etc. And it just makes it easier to hit with the big head. Also has a very clean ball peen at the back end and you can texture with that one and you can rivet with that one. So you can use multiple um, options for using this. Has a nice thick handle on this, so that's good for chasing in a repousse as well, nice and strong. Next hammer is just a basic goldsmith hammer they call this. So smaller head, nice and flat, you can see what's going on and you can use that for stretching the metal on either the steel block, the anvil or a ring mandrel. You can also use the other side has a tapered head, that's called a raising head, and you can use that for um, texturing, you can use it for forming. If you're into the copper um, forming, like leaves, and you're stretching the leaves out, you can use this head here to stretch the metal to give you a nice curved leaf shape, for example. So they're the three essential hammers. Um, next we're building up to the saw frames. So the saw frame I have here is uh, a nice German one. Um, it's adjustable on the side. It is also has a tensioner on the end. So you can undo this, loosen it up, put your blade in, get it fairly tight, and then do the final tensioning with the tensioner at the end. The handle's very ergonomic, nice and comfortable as well. You'll also need a range of saw blades. So you can get a coarse saw blades. So there's 12 saw blades in this bundle, all the same. Uh, this is uh, number three, I think it is. So it's very coarse, so I'd call this hack and slash. So if you're just reducing metal quickly, not too fussed about the final shape, you'd use this for cutting through thicker metal, stock gauge, that sort of thing. Your normal bench saw blade could be a, a 3.0 saw blade. Um, that covers most of your work. So you can get some detail and it's not too coarse that you don't have to do a lot of cleanup. And then a fine saw blade. So this is a 6.0. So you can do decorative piercing work with this one, less clean up, etc. Think about the thickness of your metal though. It's a very thick metal. Um, you can get away with a thicker blade. If it's very thin metal and you use a thick blade, it's going to chatter and you're just going to wreck your piece doing that. And Bill, there's something you've got there that will complement the saw blades as well. That's correct, Peter. So what I have here is some Pro Cup lubrication. This works well for um, burrs, drill bits, uh, allows you to cut and drill with bits very cleanly. It also doubles up onto your saw blade as well. So it has a little compressor at the back if you like. You can slide it up and run your saw blade through that. Lubricating the blade, it just makes the cutting a lot easier. Um, especially if you're going through things like brass, etc. It just makes the cutting so much smoother. Okay, so what we also have is a set of needle files. So uh, we have a pack of six needle files. It's a really good starter set to go with. There's a cut to um, profiles, uh, ranging from squares to triangular to flat to half rounds. Um, just a tip with these, effectively have two cuts in these. If you press hard, it's going to move metal really well. If you back off the pressure and go quite light, you can get a very smooth finish with a cut to file. So that's a good bench one to have. Next we have the larger 6 inch files. So the two main files you probably want to get is the slim half round. The slim form in the half round allows you to go on the inside of ring shanks and clean up your joins and smooth them out. Um, the standard width ones, quite wide, uh, they can hit the side of your ring shank from the inside and mark quite savagely. So they're the same price, so go for the slim one and that works out well. Also have the blue screw on handle, so if you're having troubles putting handles on, these are about 10 seconds to put a handle on. Very handle, handy, handle. <laughs> and you can uh, fit and swap between files really quickly. Um, next file we have is a pillar or a flat file. Um, great for squaring up edges of metal, um, all your basic work. It has a safe edge too, so don't forget to use your safe edge. The safe edge has no cutting surface on it, so you can rest that on your peg, for example, without destroying your peg. 
You can also rest it against your hands if you tend to use your hands as a guide. For your files, you can rest that edge against your finger and you're not going to abrade your finger and wreck your nails. Also have um, emery sticks. So we have pre-done emery sticks here in different grades. Um, it just allows you to finish and get the file marks out on a lot of pieces. You can make your own. You just get a sheet of emery and wrap it around a ruler or a paint paddle, something like that similar. These are pre-done, glued down, all ready to go, so very handy. And a nice little add-on for the emery stick range is these, um, I call them fingernail, large fingernail files, I suppose you call them. Uh, come in about six different grits. They're soft and they curve, so you can follow contours really well. Um, give a nice finish, they go up to about 3,000 grit. Also have on the bench here a forming set or a dapping set. That includes your dapping block with a whole range of different dapping holes. So I'll bring this a bit closer. So this is a really good block because it has a nice progression of dapping holes that you could use. So you could do pearl cups, you could do lockets, um, pretty much anything with a dome in there, flowers, anything you like. So that block itself is quite good and it comes with a very good range of dapping punches. So your dapping punches you can also use for repousse, texturing, um, you can use it as a forming stake so you can put this into a, a vise for example and form your metal over the top. You don't have to use it in the block. Um, you can also use the handle part there in conjunction with the anvil we showed before as the swaging part so you can curve the metal into the swaging area as well. Also have in here a ring clamp. If you're making rings sometimes you can get quite awkward to hold the small pieces um, in your hand while you're filing and cutting. So a ring clamp is an essential for that. This is a basic wedge one. So you put your ring in the end, wedge in the bottom, bit of compression. It's nice and stable now. Very easy to move around and you would rest that against your peg to do all your filing and settings etc. Also have a steel mandrel, so this is a particularly good one to, to start off with. So the taper on this is nice and soft, the markings there are nice, they're not um, deep so it won't mark your metal or your ring shank. Um, and price marks around about $33, $35 so it's a really good entry um, ring mandrel. Also have head loops, so my eyes go, I'm getting old. so. If you're in the same position, consider getting head loops. There's a range of different head loops for different magnifications. So this one here is a one and three quarters. So that's a good focal distance to your peg. So that works really well on a bench environment. Um, the higher magnification, the closer the focal distance is. So you find your head's getting closer to the pieces. So it's a very good idea to have a little trial and see what suits you. But a one and three quarters would be a good starting point for a peg work. And then down here, we have our plier set. So the plier set, this is a five piece plier set. It includes your half round and flat, essential for doing curves and ring shanks. Um, it also has the cutters, round nose, flat, and chain nose or snips. Um, price wise, this is a very good price wise entry for all your pliers. Um, good quality, has a spring, in there so it opens itself up so it's very handy and lastly but not leastly or second lastly I should say we have the peg itself so down here we have a basic peg and with the basic pegs you can customize this how you like you can cut your own little V in there a good tip for these allow yourself to be able to turn this upside down at the moment the slants forward so all your filing and your working is at a good angle but if you turn it upside down you've got a very nice flat surface for piercing as well it just makes it easier doing sheet work I do have two other pegs here to show you so I have your your basic um, peg that we sell combo peg it has the hole in the slots ready to go and you can clamp that on any surface you like A new peg we have now 
is uh, another combination peg. It has all the markings done there for you. So you have a whole range of different um, access points. So you can do your jump rings, for example, cut the coil of jump rings. You can put your stock gauge in here. You've got a very wide V for your sawing um, and lots of other access points. So that's a very good intro one. You can screw this to the bench too. So you don't have to clamp it. You can screw it straight to the top of your bench as well. So what's that peg called then, Bill? Uh, combination peg. Okay. So that's called a combination peg. Um, and lastly but not leastly, the bench itself. So good idea to work out the bench top as a solid piece of work there. Um, don't make it out of $4,000 mahogany because you're going to market. So a nice solid hardwood um, bench top works really well. Uh, Bill, thank you so much for that tour around the bench. I'm sure a lot of people have got a lot of information out of that and have a starting point now as to where to start with their setup with their uh, jewellery bench. So uh, if you'd like more information on that, what you need to do is just go to ajsonline.com slash bench setup. So it's slash bench setup. The URL is right here below us. And uh, just go there, you'll see all these tools listed. You can right. click on them and you'll be able to see them on our website. And please then contact uh, yeah. someone at your local showroom, either ring them up or pop in, and they'll be happy to go through that with you, determine what's ideal for your needs, and uh, then go from there. So thank you so much, Bill. Anytime, Peter. Pleasure. And we'll see you next time. Bye.